I'm Delta Work, and this is Very Delta. Maybe a girl joins me today and things get political. Are you registered to vote? Voting in your local elections is Very Delta. But first, do you want to see me go off? Because I think you want to see me go off. M. Oh. M. Mom! Are you a lady like me? Introspective, beautiful. Oh, are you intellectual like me? Beguiled by a bargain? You like wild times? Oh, like me? Are you serving the community like me? Well, if you are, then you must be Fairy Delta. I'm Delta Work, and this is Very Delta, a luxury public access podcast and YouTube talk show where I look gorgeous, speak extemporaneously, and invite fascinating people to sit on the couch and get Very Delta. Very Delta is for the woman who understands both her civic duty and a matching handbag. But first, let's get into some things that are Very Delta. Now that Christmas has settled and we're far, far away from that, I thought that we would be done with the Stanley Cup frenzy. But we're not because Target released Stanley Cups for Valentine's Day and everyone lost their mind. I just don't understand what compels people to lose their mind over something so simple. Stanley Cups have been around forever. I remember my dad and my stepdad both had those big Stanley thermos with the dangly side and the cup that you like took off and you poured. Those were like the granddaddy of the new reimagined Stanley Cups that everyone's losing their mind for. I watched videos of people going to Target and going crazy because there were red ones and pink ones. I get it. I get the idea of wanting something that... um is so special and specific. Maybe it has like a beautiful design on it or it's the Elsa Frozen commemorative whatever, but like a pink cup. There are so many other brands that have the same idea that actually work better than the Stanley Cup. Like the Stanley Cup, come on, the technology isn't so elevated and so insane that nobody else can replicate it. There wasn't even any special design. It wasn't like hearts or or uh, something that says like, I love you to the moon or anything that even denoted that it was so special to Valentine's Day. So it made it collectible. Just the company said, here you go. Here's a pink cup and here's a red cup. Lose your mind. And everyone was like, ah, I had to have the cup. What is it? A, is it like a sense of community? Is it like a belonging? Is it because no one is sending or putting anything out there in the universe that's collectible anymore? Is that is that what it is? Because I watched people at Christmas, their videos on TikTok, like losing their mind and crying, like children crying because their parents got them this cup. I don't know if the world or or, or corporate America just has us fooled into believing like this is what you need. This is what you want. This is what's going to help you like uh, feel extra special. And these cups are like $40. I mean, you can get Listen, do you love it? I love it. I got it at Ross. You can go to Ross and when you're standing there to check out, you are welcomed by table after table after table of very similar to Stanley Cups, but with designs and like cool shit all over them. I I just I just don't understand what is compelling people to like show up somewhere and be like, look what I got. You could never. I, I could ever. I could very ever, I could ever, I just, it's a thermos. It is a, why the Stanley brand? Why that stamp on it? I guess I've just never understood, like, I've never really held a lot of space for myself to want to wear things that have, like, just an emblem on them that, like, do you remember when Champion brand was, like, gross? 
I think they had Champion at Payless. And you know as well as I do, if you are someone of my age or maybe within 10 years of my age, um, that once upon a time when people would go to Payless and you would wear like your Payless shoes, people would be like, ooh, like in school, uh, people would be like, oh my God, you have pro wings. Ew. Like, and that was like their athletic shoe. And then they started to carry Champion. And then what's the other one? Maybe American Eagle or something. And so people would always look down on it like it was nothing. Then out of no where I don't know if champion rebranded or what happened, but now all of a sudden people are like, Ooh, look at my champion sweater. Isn't it sick? Isn't it fierce? Isn't it busting to have this? Like why? Cause you, a label is written on there. What makes it so much better? So the the mug, the Stanley mug, listen, if Stanley wants to send me mugs, I will drink out of them gladly. But if the solo brand wants to send me a sleeve of 30 red cups, I will drink out of those as well. It's a fucking cup. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, there's nothing so extra special about it where you're like, ooh, look, it's encrusted in rhinestones. Like, when people go crazy for the Starbucks cups, I get it. I look at them and I'm like, there's something special about that. It looks like it's rhinestone with hematite rhinestones. It looks like it's rhinestone with pink rhinestones. It has this sort of rainbow glaze on it. That's pretty. That's different. That's something exciting. But just a pink mug and then you want to lose your mind over it. And children are opening them at Christmas and, and people are like, they're holding it. They're embracing it. They're like, I can't believe you got, you can't believe it, huh? You really can't believe that someone got you. You just opened a, a gaming system. You just opened a, 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 a remote control car. You just opened, I don't know a champion sweater that you've been living for, but you got this mug and you said, oh baby, guess what? My asshole fell out. I cannot believe that I now have a vessel to put my water in and drink out of. And I'm going to go walk in front of everyone over at fucking pickleball and show them like, <laughs> guess what I got that you didn't get? A cup, a special cup. And you know what else is weird is everyone says, my Stanley Cup, my Stanley Cup. How come nobody ever really thinks about the athletic Stanley Cup? The goal of saying like, look, we won the Stanley Cup. Like nobody thinks about the actual Stanley Cup. They think of the Stanley Cup. But what about the Stanley Cup? They're going to have to rename the actual award because everybody is so enamored with a fucking thermos. They've lost their minds. I just, I, I'm telling you, I lose my mind maybe when like MAC Cosmetics comes out with a color I've always loved, but in a new formulation. So they'll say, guess what? You loved Ruby Woo lipstick. We're going to reformulate it into Powder Kiss formula or whatever it's called. I don't know if I'm getting it right. But you know what I'm saying. At least there's something new about it, something different, more than just the color of the packaging. In this sense, it's the actual formula. So if somebody said, we have new Stanley cups and what they do is you unscrew them and you can fit your snacks down inside of it and then you set your water back in and twist it. That's reimagined. Then I would say, oh, you mean you've only put out 10 of those to each store? Well, I've been looking for such a thing and this one does more than another cup. So maybe I will go to the store and hope that I can find one. Now, I don't know that I'm going to trample anyone. But of course, you know, if I can't order it online, I probably don't want it. Because then that means if I have to go into the store, then I'm going to have to deal with people. And then I'm not doing any of that. I'm not doing any of that. People are, though. People have been convinced. You have to have it. A mug? You're losing your mind over a mug? You're trampling people for a mug? And I don't even, you know, I don't take a refill cup with me places. I think people used to do that. Like at Starbucks, you could take your cup in and they would refill it. And then the pandemic came and we don't do cross-contamination. The same reason why stop going to McDonald's or any drive through and saying to them, could you throw this out for me? They can't do it. They can't introduce your trash into the store. They have no idea what you have in there. Stop going. Well, it's not that big of a deal. You have a trash can in there. Hey, fuck you. You throw it away. It's not their job. They don't want to take your fucking muckle rags and throw them away. You throw it away. The same way when I go to uh, 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 7-Eleven. I don't take my refill cup. I would rather get, you know, the big 
what is it like the XXL soda? You know, I'm going to get the big one. You know that the kind I need two hands to drink out of just because maybe that's me flossing. Maybe, maybe if they made a Stanley cup that big, I would be the one that finally got up off my ass and ran into the store for it. But speaking of 7-Eleven, why is it that at 7-Eleven, first of all, a very hostile environment, because when you go in, nobody's trying to greet you. You know, the oven stinks. We already talked about that. But when you go up to check out, this is me every time. When I leave here today, this will happen to me. I promise you. I promise you this will happen. I will go in. I will get my things. I will go to the register. And the person will be at the register and they'll go, uh, zah, zah, and then she said, zah, 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 and, zah, zah. and that's just me, like, get, creating gibberish, whatever it is, whoever, whatever it is they're saying. And I'll go, I'm sorry, what was that? And they'll go, ah. And they'll point at their ears. And, like, I look at them and I'm just like, did you say something? And they're like, uh, I'm on the phone. I'm on the phone. Oh. Oh, well, pardon the fuck out of me. I just, I'm so sorry that I assumed that when I went up to the register and said hello and you didn't look up at me, that maybe you didn't hear me. And then when you start talking at me at a really loud voice, and then I go, I'm sorry, what was that? And then I'm supposed to assume that you're always on a call? Why are you always on a call? Well, when you're in a store and you're helping a customer, you don't need to be having your phone out, okay? Yeah, a mom and pop shop where you sell earrings or something. Maybe that's a little bit different. But when you're bringing lots of people in, lots of traction at 7-Eleven, the customer thinks that you're talking to them. And then you look at me fucking crazy because I'm like, oh, well, I, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were on a call. And then they kind of look at you like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, fuck you, man. How about you get off the phone? What, because you're in your earphones, like that's not really a phone? You realize that it's just a different form of the same technology. You're still completing the same task. You're spending, you're spending your time talking to someone else when you should be talking to me right here. Don't you want to know my loyalty number? Don't you want to upsell the candy that's on the counter? Don't you want to know why I want to know why you are a hostile environment and are playing opera music outside so people without a home don't congregate in front of your store, even though it's fucking freezing cold outside? The place up the street from here, the 7-Eleven up the street from here, the lady tried to tell me to not give the person outside any money because they were just going to come around over and over. Well, guess what? I hope they fucking do. They're hungry. They're thirsty. It's freezing all over this country. And they're trying to stand by a doorway where it's just a little bit warm. Shut up, bitch. Shut up, bitch. I'll give whoever whatever money I fucking want. And what do people say? Oh, they're going to use it on drugs. I hope they do. Go buy as much drugs as you want, babe, on me. Do a line for me. Ugh. Do you want to see me take a break? Because I really need to take a break. Do you have expensive taste when it comes to perfume like me? Do you end up with a shelf full of half-used bottles like me? Well, with Scentbird, you can have great taste and switch up your fragrance routine without breaking the bank. I am someone who will blindly buy fragrance because I love the bottle or because somebody told me it was really great. And then I end up with fragrance that I just give away. With Scentbird, it's totally the opposite. You can narrow down your selections without doing any crazy research. You can just say, I'm this type of personality. I'm flirty. I'm sexy. I'm elegant. Maybe you want to go according to season or occasion. Something you want to wear to work, something you want to wear on a date, or maybe you know exactly that you like a sweet fragrance, a fresh fragrance, whatever it is, you can go in, narrow it all down, and they will supply to you a selection of fragrances that you can go from for there. I narrowed down a few fragrances. This one's called Get a Room and order champagne. It's got raspberry, mandarin on the top, jasmine, patchouli, and vanilla in the base. I mean, this is right up my alley. I also got Mind Games, which is black licorice, pink peppercorn, Egyptian jasmine, white gardenia, cocoa bean. These fragrances are layered, they're leveled, and with Scentbird, you can have anything that you want right at your fingertips. Scentbird is a fragrance subscription service that gives you the opportunity to shop from over 700 brands, choose a new designer fragrance to try every month, and then it's shipped right to your door 
for just $17. It's available in the US and Canada. Scentbird has perfumes and colognes and a lot of unisex options and you receive a 30 day supply with each shipment. Plus, the Scentbird subscription is flexible, so you can skip any month or pause without penalties. And with an exclusive offer just for our listeners, you can get 55% off of your first month today. That's only $8 for your very first fragrance. Go to Scentbird.com and use my code VERYDELTA for 55% off your first month. Again, that's S C E N T. B I R D dot com for you to try your first perfume or cologne for only eight dollars. Again, that's S C E N T bird dot com for you to try your first perfume or cologne for just eight dollars. Sign on and smell amazing. My guest today is putting in the work. The first drag queen in U.S. history to hold elected office. Please welcome Maybe a Girl. Hey, everybody. Hi, I'm Delta. I'm so happy you're here. We've been talking about this forever. We have. We really have. I'm yeah. so excited to finally be here on the couch next to you in the desk. I love it. I love this. We work together um, most regularly at Exposure Drag. Exposure Drag, yes. Yeah. Where you host, you perform. Mm -hmm. And so I always love doing that because I feel like when we're in that space, that's one of the specific places in L.A. there, um, whenever I've done Meatballs show, where people come to absorb whatever drag you're giving them. They're on board with the story, the look, all of it. They're, it's like it really feels judgment free. Absolutely. They're there for the show. And as any drag performer knows. It's hit or miss sometimes. You'll sometimes perform for an audience and you're just like, hey, hey, we're performing right. here. But at Exposure, it's never like that. They're there for the show. And it really makes you feel welcome, makes you feel like you can kind of do anything. And they're generally, generally very supportive, the right. audience. Right. Um, you know, they're not going to pity applaud you, but they're paying attention and they are excited to see what you have to offer. Right. How long have you been performing? Uh, actually, since I started at Exposure. That's uh, my home show. Um, I started there in the summer of 2015. That was the first year that uh, Exposure was around. Actually, I think they were just about to celebrate their one-year anniversary. So I came in close to the one-year mark, and we're about to hit the 10-year mark. So I'm also about to hit the 10-year mark. Wow. That's fierce. Yeah. I love that. And you're originally from Southern California or? No, no. I've, uh, I'm have i Pittsburgh to Chicago to L.A. So I was born and raised in Pittsburgh. We moved to Chicago when I was about nine. That's kind of where I came of age. And then I moved to L.A. in my late 20s because, uh, as anybody in the Midwest knows, uh, you get a little sick of the winters. Mm -hmm. And uh, I needed some warm, beautiful Southern California weather. So mm -hmm. I, I moved out here for the weather. You were elected to Silver Lake Neighborhood Council in 2019, mm -hmm. and you currently hold the position of treasurer, and now you're running for Congress. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So tell us about that whole... Yeah. So I, um, I, it's kind of wild to think I've been in, actually been in elected politics for about five years now. Uh, when I decided to run in 2019, I decided to run because I wanted to make a difference in my community. Um, I think that local politics is the most important form of politics only because it really affects you the most. It affects your neighbors the most. Uh, you know, everybody tends to hyper focus on who am I voting for for the president of the United States, when in reality, the president probably has the least impact on your direct life and the direct life of your family and neighbors versus um, local politics. So I actually saw a Facebook ad saying that the Silver Lake Neighborhood Council was holding elections. And I said to myself, huh, I'd like to be involved in local politics. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to put my name out there. And I think that the big fear of anybody running for any political position is, is anybody going to vote for me? I think the big fear is that the day after election day, you have one vote and it's the one vote that you cast for yourself. Mm -hmm. So after we campaigned and I put out my message and we won. And I was so excited about that because, you know, people didn't vote for me because I'm a drag queen. They didn't vote for me because I'm a trans person. They voted for me because they liked the ideas that I wanted to bring to our community. And mm -hmm. I think that's why we should be voting for politicians, not because they're the most well-spoken or, oh, I like what, you know, he's wearing or she's wearing. He's cute. Um, you really have to think about what they're talking about, what they want to actually put into effect, the changes that they want to make in your district. Yeah, I always wonder because um, 
When you were elected in 2019, you became the first drag queen in history to hold public office. And I wonder what the opposition from people, because we think of optics when you say, oh, I'm going to vote for someone based on the way they look or how they sound or how they appealed to me uh, based on just those things. Do the optics of uh, someone who does drag as part of their living, does it play into basically kind of the main reason why people go, I'm not going to vote for that person yep. because look at that clown. Look yep. at that. They throw that around. The optics really do for some people and for some reason, it's only that. Absolutely. I think that it is actually been um, a little more difficult to run as somebody who is a drag performer, because I think that a lot of people, especially folks who are not fans of drag, they view drag as sort of this silly, unserious thing. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's a silliest, unserious element to doing drag. But drag performers are some of the most uh, compassionate, knowledgeable, socially active people that I know. And I've had to overcome a lot of obstacles. Uh, the first, because this is my third time running for Congress now. The first time that I ran, a lot of people were like, oh, are you really running for Congress? What, I'm sorry, can a drag queen not really run for Congress? Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a lot of uh, homophobia. There's a lot of transphobia intermixed in there. The fact that you wouldn't vote for me or somebody else because they are a drag performer, you really have to sort of unpack the homophobia and transphobia there. Right. So that is something that we really had to overcome in the first election that we took part in. And, you know, when I ran in 2020, we came in third place out of eight candidates. And we did so much better than anybody ever thought we would. In fact, we were so close to getting that second place spot. We were less than 1% away from wow. coming in second place. And the top two candidates in California move on to the general election. So we said, of course, we have to try this again. So I ran again in 2020. This time there were nine candidates running. It was the most crowded congressional primary in the whole state of California. And we came in second place. We moved on to the general election against a an incumbent who had been in office for over 20 years with over $15 million in their campaign accounts. And here is wow. our little rinky-dink campaign that is, you know, we don't have a lot of money, but we have a lot of passion. We have a lot of ideas for what we want to bring to the district and to the nation. And that resonates with people. Yeah, I would think so. It's just uh, people are so afraid of change. And I feel like, you know, as somebody who grew up in the 80s and, and watched Back to the Future, I say this, I use this as a reference point all the time. Are we supposed to be in flying cars right now? Hello. Like I, I think of like Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Like, aren't we supposed to be <laughs> shoulder to shoulder with people who look vastly different, that come from vastly different places with vastly different ideas, but come together and go, hey, let's do what's right instead of being right and crediting just one person to go, see what I did for everyone. Why? why I, it's just it, that fear that like, again, the idea of people saying, well, what are you really going to run like that in itself? That question and that sort of like wince and that sort of, is so degrading. It's so degrading. And it's also, to me, that in and of, in and of itself is such a joke because I don't think that those people who ask that kind of a question really realize how much goes into running a political campaign. Nobody does it as a joke because you're pouring so much of your personal time, your personal money, your personal energy into trying to make a difference for your community. Mm -hmm. And then for somebody to say, is this a joke? It's it's so uh, it's so insulting. And mm -hmm. so that was really the big thing we had to overcome in our first election uh, but again, the fact that we came in third out of eight was really remarkable. And then we came in second place out of nine candidates in 2022. And we made history. It was the first time that a trans non-binary person has ever advanced to a general election for a seat in U.S. Congress. Wow. And how has that changed how people interact with you or how they see you, whether it's people you know or people in the community? It's been a while now that we have finally been taken seriously, and it, it really allows us to actually do the kind of work that we are setting out to do and not just trying to explain to people, yeah, I am a, a drag performer, yeah, I am a trans person, but I'm running for office. And I think the reason that it is so people ask questions about it is because they haven't seen it before. So I try not to take it too personally, even though it can be a little insulting. I try not to take it personally because people haven't seen drag performers in office. They haven't seen trans people in office. You know, we're just getting to the point where we have seen transgender people being elected on state levels. But there has never been a transgender person federally elected to the United States of America. And that's not representation. Uh, I was at a debate last weekend, and my closing statement, one of the things that I said was, 
out of the more than 13,000 people who have been in the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate since its inception, there has never been a transgender person. And yet we are living in one of these eras where transgender people, LGBTQIA people, we are being the targets mm. of, of, of legislation against us. 2023 was the worst year in modern history, in all of history, for anti-LGBTQIA legislation. There were more than 600 bills introduced to try to take away our rights. Right. We better be standing up and running for office. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's that that idea that we're so caught up. People are so caught up in this and 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 uh, uh, villainizing and uh, the community but then not inviting any of that community to the table to say, all right, we want to tell you why we have these problems. They don't really have a problem. They don't. Their problem is the optics and this idea of I'm going to be right. This is the way it's always been. It's always worked this way. When I grew up, it was this way. But we're grown now. When you when people use that defense constantly, this uh, this is the way I was raised. But you're saying then that you know that you're raised. And you know that you can make a different decision and you can go, let's reevaluate this. This was a little or very wrong. We need to amplify all these voices. And I know that's what you're about a thousand percent. But it's so interesting how many of these incumbents with uh, tons of money and that people just blindly. I think that's another thing when people vote. A lot of times they will just go, well, I'll vote for the president and the vice president and everything else. I don't really know any of that. And I think it's our job to know that. Absolutely. You know, that is one of the things that I've always said that even if I never get elected to Congress, I know that I'm setting the path for somebody like me to walk into those halls of Congress and make a difference, to really have an impact and really offer true representation. Yes. You know, rep they say representation matters. It really matters, especially when we have trans people have no representation in office, and yet we have these legislators directly legislating against us. I, in my mind, I have this vision of these like 12 old white guys sitting around a, a board table saying, okay, let's put out this anti-trans legislation. And no trans people are there at that table to say, no, this isn't right for reasons right. A, B, and C. And yet they put out this legislation and it, it unfortunately appeals to a lot of their conservative right-wing voters. The thing is, I really don't think that a lot of these people actually have a problem with LGBTQIA people, but they know it's sort of a, a talking point for mm -hmm. their platform. And so, oh yeah, we're going to get um, LGBTQIA out of schools. And it's like, you know what, actually we're fighting to get LGBTQIA inclusion and recognition and education in schools. Because I remember what it was like in the late 90s and early 2000s going to school and not seeing anything or anybody that was like me. And it made me feel like there was something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. And I wish that I had seen a politician, a legislator, somebody saying, you know what? It's not only okay to be you, you deserve to be here. Right. There is something wrong with you. <laughs> Let's take a break. And we are back. Uh, we are with maybe a girl. Uh, before uh, we go any further, I was thinking about something that you hit on. And that was when you said a lot of these people don't necessarily have the biggest problem with LGBTQIA plus people. And it's something I noticed recently. And that is I feel like once we started getting a lot of these drag bands and a lot of story time, uh, people having issues with that, um, I noticed that some of the brunches that I perform in that were largely um, cis people coming into the brunches, maybe for the first time ever, maybe as repeat people, it kind of started dwindling. Hmm. And I thought to myself after having this conversation with Jules, we came to this idea that we wondered if the bands and all of that made people who we're sort of just coming into a drag show going, okay, this seems like a safe thing. It's brunch, it's daytime. I'm not gonna be in a gay club at night kind of thing. Maybe they started second guessing it and going, well, there's all these bands and you know, maybe drag is dangerous. And so I wonder if those people that wanted to come are now sort of siding with this idea that like, yeah, well, 
maybe we shouldn't be. Do you think that could be a thing? I do think it could be a thing. And I think that's, I think it really speaks to the fact that there is not only so much misinformation, right. but disinformation about what drag is. I mean, it is so wild to me that there, that we have states, legislators spending their time and spending taxpayer resources on instituting drag bans. That's what we're having our elected officials spend their time and money on. It makes no sense to me. At all. But I think, unfortunately, it does strike a chord with somebody who doesn't really know a lot about drag or what it is. And I think that there has been, uh, you know, they've misconstrued drag as being a purely sexual, purely adult-themed kind of entertainment. Right. And I will say, you know, we've worked so many different kinds of gigs. You know that some gigs are a little bit more appropriate, a little more family friendly and some are not you know if you're working a gig that is at a bar the show's at midnight it's 21 and up you know you can probably be uh, you know a little more graphic in your presentation right but, you know, as somebody like myself who hosts and produces a drag brunch, you know, I always try to keep that in mind that we actually do have some young people in the audience. So, you know, I'll be a little more lenient in the the language that I'm using or what sort of themes I'm going with. But there has been this, um, you know, the right has sort of portrayed drag as just being purely sexual, as if it's some sort of fetish, as if we're getting off mm -hmm. on doing drag. Mm -hmm. Well, we're just trying to make a few dollars in tips. Right. Um, you know, I actually... I recently went on the Tim Pool show. Tim Pool is a right wing podcaster. I had a lot of reservations about going on his show. He invited me. They were discussing Drag Queen Story Hour and drag shows in general and whether or not it's appropriate for all ages. And I at first I didn't want to go on. But when I thought about it, I thought to myself, you know what? The reason I do want to go on is because, A, I'm not platforming this dude. He's got millions of viewers already. The main reason I wanted to go on was because I thought about all of the people that are watching his kind of content and who sort of get sucked into that Fox News right wing content. And they're constantly fed this idea of what drag is and what trans people are. And it's always fetishized. It's always sexualized. And I said, I bet you a lot of these people have never even talked to a, a, a trans person or somebody who does drag. And I said, you know what? I want to go on the show. And even if I change one person's heart or mind about what it is to be a drag drag performer or to be a trans person, then I have done my job. And I went on and it was difficult. It was, you know, there were some uncomfortable questions. Uh, but ultimately, at the end, I ended up getting some messages from people. I, I got a message from somebody saying, hey, I just want to let you know, you know what, I'm a Trump supporter, but I really appreciated hearing what you had to say. And it changed my mind about, you know, what drag is and what, what it is to be a trans person. And that meant so much to me. And that, that goes to show that, you know, people are people. And I think that, you know, we most people hopefully don't wish harm upon others. And I think it's just a lot of misunderstanding. And I think that if you actually take the time to speak with somebody who is a drag performer, speak with somebody who is a, a transgender person, you will realize that we are all just human beings trying to get by like everybody else. Right. That's 100 percent true. So you are running for Congress now. You are mm -hmm. currently running. Yes. And what what what's going into this? What is what, what oh, do we need to know? It's a lot of work. So, you know, I mentioned we came in second place last year. We made it to the general election. It was a huge deal. We got more than 60,000 votes in the general election. Mm -hmm. I don't know 60,000 people, but there are at least 60,000 people that want to see what I'm fighting for. And you know what? I always say this whenever I'm giving a campaign speech or an interview. Do not vote for me because I am a drag queen. Do not even vote for me because I'm a transgender person. Vote for me because you believe in the policies that I want to to enact, which are all based in intersectional humanitarianism and based in economic equity. So things like universal health care, housing for all, tuition-free college, environmental justice, racial justice, LGBTQIA rights, labor rights, tenant rights, reproductive rights, staying out of war. These are all ideas that I think most people can get behind. Right. The election is March 5th. It's March 5th. You're in the 30th Congressional district. Yes. And where is that? So California's 30th congressional district is, it's a big district. So it's uh, all of West Hollywood, all of Hollywood, Silver Lake, Echo Park. Oh, it's huge. It goes north over the Hollywood Hills into Burbank, Glendale, parts of Pasadena. It goes even further north up into Montrose, Sunland, Tahunga, and then it goes all the way south down to LACMA. So it's a really wow. big district. Is there an area that you, like within that, where you have to focus more on? 
You know, it's it's kind of tough because we have, you know, we've limited resources. We have raised quite a bit of money for a campaign that is entirely corporate free and grassroots. We've raised over $100,000 of grassroots money this year, wow. which is incredible. But we're up against some opponents who have raised over a million dollars who are sponsored by corporations, you know, folks who are claiming that they care about health care, but they're getting all of their money from Blue Cross Blue Shield. Do you think that somebody who's being funded by Blue Cross Blue Shield is going to fight for universal health care? I don't think so. Uh, So a big part of our, you know, a big part of our strategy has been making sure that everybody who would vote for us vote for us, but also making sure that some of the voters who are maybe a little bit, um, you know, in the middle, a little more moderate, know about our campaign. Because it's interesting to me that a lot of the policies that we're fighting for are described as radical left, but there's nothing radical about health care for everybody. There's nothing radical about housing for everybody and education for everyone. And I've always felt if everyone was guaranteed healthcare, housing, and education, this would be a better place for everybody. So we've been focusing on making sure that our voting base knows about us and making sure that the folks who might vote about, vote for us at least know about our campaign and they make an informed decision. Yeah, I think what's radical is um, like trying to eliminate people. What's <laughs> radical is building a wall, not a bigger table. Exactly. That is radical. That's crazy to think that people in... People living here with us together, shoulder to shoulder, do not deserve to equally have access to stay alive. Delta, I think it's really interesting. I'm actually a little triggered by the word access Mm -hmm. because that is actually a buzzword that a lot of uh, moderate politicians like to use. They love to say, we want to guarantee access to health care. Well, you know what? We all have access to that hospital down the road, but can we afford it? It's an affordability issue. And... Uh, here's the thing. If we can afford endless wars, if we can afford to send bombs all across the world, we can afford to give people health care, housing and education here. You know, people say, oh, the system is broken. Is it broken or is it working exactly <laughs> as it was supposed to work? Either way, we are, we keep electing the same people over and over. Right. We, we keep pointing out, oh, we have all of these problems, these things we want to fix. Why do we keep electing the same kinds of politicians, these same establishment, corporate backed people? who really only care about their corporate donors and not the people that voted to elect them into office. Now, where can people register to vote? Because it's really important for them to hear it from you. If you live in L.A., you can go to lavote.org. Or if you live anywhere in the United States, you can go to vote.gov. What can people who can't vote but want to support you, what can they do? There are a couple of ways that people can help. I mean, obviously, we need the votes, but really spreading our message. You know, if you don't live in California's 30th Congressional District, but you live in Kansas or Chicago or Florida, um, first of all, it it doesn't cost money. You can share our posts. You can help us with volunteering. But also, we need funding. If people can, you know, donate to our campaign. I mentioned earlier, we have raised over $100,000 in grassroots corporate free funding. We have over 3,000 individual donors. Donors. Wow. And I think that people think, oh, if I'm going to be a donor for a political campaign, I, I've got to shell out all this money. You don't. If you have $5, $10 you can spare, it really makes a big difference in a grassroots campaign like ours. Mm-hmm. Because, as I mentioned, we have some uh, establishment opponents who have 10 times as much money as we are. I got a mailer yesterday from one of my opponents, and it's literally the size of a magazine. And here we are, you know, going door to door, putting door hangers on people's doors doors, knocking on doors, talking to them. We don't have the money to put out these giant uh, mailers. We would love to be able to get a billboard or a TV ad, but unfortunately that costs money. And because we've taken a corporate corporate free pledge. We rely on donations from from people. So if folks can donate five, ten, twenty five dollars, they can donate up to thirty three hundred dollars if anybody has that. I know there might be an angel donor watching. Uh, we could really use the campaign funds. Thirty three hundred dollars. Um. I feel bad because um, you gifted me a mug, a maybe for Congress mug, and I've had it on this desk, not this desk, a different desk, for other episodes. And we have a kitchen here at the studio, and we have everyone has like collectible sort of mugs, and we wash them and share the mugs. And that mug has been on every desk in this office, which I love. I wish it was here. I should have had it here. I apologize to you, and I apologize to everyone. But really, 
it's so important to to get this merch and make this merch visible because when you brand something like that and people see it over and over and over and I hate to use the word brand because this is not your brand this is your this is your life this is your passion this is something that you're doing for the good of other people so it's not a brand but in a way that other people will understand when you see that over and over it instills in people oh what is that bag who is that what is me what what does it mean maybe a girl cuz maybe some people don't know they're like is that a, is that is that a brand and so when you buy that kind of merchandise it says to other people, it starts a conversation. So it really is important. So if you see uh, maybe out on the campaign trail or you see Chloe or you see anybody that's doing this, it's really important to pick up a piece of that. Not only is it something that you're doing something good, you can actually use this stuff. I mean, we're talking about bags. We're talking about the mugs that have been in every office here. T-shirts. We have T-shirts. Yeah. I don't wear clothing, but (laughs) for other people that do, um, they might want to wear a shirt. Yeah. If you go to our website, maybeagirlforcongress.org, you can get all of our campaign merch and all of the funds go directly into our campaign and every dollar counts. I love that. Every dollar. Every dollar does count. Did you um, run for student council when you were in school? <laughs> I did not actually. No. I should have though. I would have won. Who were you in high school? Who was I in high school? I was a little bit of everybody trying to figure out myself. I think first part of high school I was trying to fit in. I did sports. I did football. And then I got into theater and I met my people. Yeah. And I realized I'm more of an arts kind of gal. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. My first um, I went to a private school my first two years and I was bullied just endlessly. And, you know, I think that's a big part of the reason why I want to fight for LGBTQIA youth is I remember what it was like to be a queer youth. And I remember how uh, othered I felt and how um, ostracized I felt. And I said to myself, I don't want anybody to ever have to feel like that again. And I feel like we're starting to make progress there. But I still think that people are um, youth are still unfortunately learning some of the bad habits of their their parents and you know mm-hmm. folks who don't understand what it is like to be a queer person. Um, but yeah, I was bullied rel- relentlessly early on in high school. And then when I went to public school and came out, um, all of a sudden I was cool for coming out. And it was a totally different experience. And I think, I don't know, I was just really grateful to be surrounded by people that were not only okay, but very welcoming once I came out. And I didn't feel like I had to hide it anymore. Mm -hmm. When you're on the campaign trail, what is in your go bag? (laughs) Everything. Uh, Usually, well, I've got my Maybe for Congress tote bag. It's filled with Maybe for Congress flyers. Uh, Usually a bottle of water, um, an orange soda for after Uh campaigning. My campaign manager and I, Chloe, we love to have an orange soda after we campaign. Just love the flavor. I think we just love the flavor. We actually did um, last year. We did this fun thing where we did kind of a taste test. We tried all the different orange sodas. Which one is the best? Okay, that was just sort of a fun little thing that we we did um, after canvassing. Okay. And what would be the fast food place that you would hit? I would say probably, and this is funny because this is not of my upbringing, but Jack in the Box. Um, We don't have a lot of Jack in the Box in Chicago or Pittsburgh, but, you know, and I think I actually really got into Jack in the Box after doing Exposure Oh, my God, totally. It's right next door. Just get some curly fries and a shake. Go home and you're good to go. (laughs) Every time I get in that drive-thru, there's somebody else that was either in the show or watching the show that's in line. And and the other day it was Chloe. Yes. And she's like screaming at me. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, (laughs) someone trying to, like, beat me up. Like, what's going on? And then I, like, looked and I'm like... Chloe and she like put one <laughs> leg out of the car and all I could see was the the thigh high stocking and you know there was, it was this the is Chloe the Chloe darling not Chloe my campaign manager right oh my god well it was Chloe the campaign manager as well um, was at the Burger King drive through no let's take a break. <laughs> Where do you want to go? Maybe. Would you go to Libya? Sure. Would you go to Peru? Sure. I'll go anywhere. Would you go to um, Echo Park? I'd go there every week. Every (laughs) chance I get. (laughs) I love that. Okay. And we are back with Maybe a Girl, who is running for Congress in the 30th District here in Los Angeles. Um, This is the part of the podcast talk show. However, you if you're watching, it's a talk show a luxury public access talk show. If you're listening, it is a podcast with a visual element. So it just depends on how you like to consume. Um, This is the part that we call Read Me Delta. Read Me Delta! 
this one says to Ms. Work if you're nasty. Are you? I mean, I, I've been known to be, but um, we are filming this during the day, so we have to, um, <laughs> you know. Oh, your name's on here too. Dearest Delta and maybe. Oh. What would you have to say about uncomfortable flirting from a waiter who you do not find attractive at all? In fact, they're extremely annoying in their attention to you over the rest of the group of people that you went to brunch with. I'll raise the stakes and set the scene in a family diner in a small college town. I mean, the man said I looked like Blake or a Sheldon or a Blake Sheldon. Don't get me wrong. I love the attention from anyone flirting with me, but this was like unprompted, unexpected, unwarranted flirting. Thank you. Love the pod. And I'm wishing a fantastical new year for both of you from G. Gee, oh my Gee. gosh. You know, it's funny. I actually thought this was a targeted question because, you know, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I uh, am a drag performer. I am a local politician, but I also um, wait tables a few days a week in oh, Echo okay. Park. So I thought, are they talking about me? But I try to, I don't get flirty with the customers, mm -hmm. but I do try to entertain them. It's almost like a mini stage for me, but I try to entertain them, make them laugh a little bit, mm -hmm. bring them out of just the customer, you know, server right. relationship. Right. But um, I don't know, I might turn it back on them or like try to say something really funny to, you know, the customer then becomes the center of attention. Yeah, I, I, I see that. I see that definitely. Um, flirting is uh, my love language. I love flirting with people. I think it's wonderful. I don't I don't have the intention of going to bed with the, with everyone in the world, you know? I think it is something that you have to master or else it can come off extremely awkward. And I think as entertainers, um I remember um my partner uh and and uh having a conversation with an, another friend who does drags partner and that partner was sort of new to the drag scene and said um don't you find it uh uncomfortable when delta's like out talking to all of these people and seems to be like um you know because i'm i feel like i am a touchy person and i know that's changed quite a bit uh, since the pandemic and also since realizing that like i don't own anyone's body so it's not my place just to go touch everybody people that i personally know and i've already um um, sort of vetted that and I know that they're okay with it and they know me. It's a little bit different. But um, this person said, doesn't it make you feel uncomfortable? And my partner said, uh, Delta's an entertainer. And part of what they have to do is be in conversations with people that either may be uncomfortable or just as you said, maybe they don't know that they are being that way. They just are excited to see, uh, if not you personally, just someone who does what you do. And so um, you have to really be able to, um, in order to navigate life, really read people. Totally. I think. Isn't that just really, yeah. not just as an entertainer, but just getting through life. Well, there's also, I think, a big difference between romantic flirting mm -hmm. and social flirting. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like I socially flirt with strangers right. that I know who I feel like I have a friend crush on them. Let me see how we sure. sort of go back and forth. Sure. But I think it could be misconstrued as, is this person interested in me? And usually that's not the case. Mm -hmm. If I'm interested in you, I'll probably make it very explicit or maybe I won't but um yeah I think it's just sort of reading people you know finding out people's boundaries but I'm the same way like I I, I I've come to realize that you know not everyone likes to be even like touched or sure. even hugged you know I think even just asking oh can I give you a hug I think people appreciate that either mm -hmm. way I, I hate to say it as it's like it's a job but flirting in a way is a talent and it is, it's just inert. And some people do it very, very well because they want to show that love. They want to show their appreciation, their interest, their excitement. I'm the kind of person that like, I will gush over a lot of things. So like, um, you know, when somebody does some, a type of job that I don't understand and they make me understand it and I realize like, oh my gosh, you just struck a balance with what I do. Then I start gushing and I get excited because I realize, wow, I've just learned how similar we are in a way that I never knew, you know, or a talent. Yeah. When and you it doesn't mean you want to have sex with them. No, you just want to be around them because yeah. you're like, wow, this is so cool. Anyway, so yeah, I, I say, you know what, if someone really is giving you that sort of, did you we, can tell they Did meant. we answer G's question, you think? I think so. I mean, you know, just know that they, they meant, I think they meant their best. I mean, now if somebody is like coming on to you and they're, you can tell by the language that they're just being disgusting and you do not have any designs on that, you do have to like let them know like, you know what? I don't look like Blake Shelton. Fuck off. I don't look like Blake Shelton. 
fuck off. And you can say that. That's okay. Hi, Delta and maybe. What are your thoughts on sparkling water? More specifically, these new flavors of sparkling water that mimic soda flavors. Are they very Delta? Are they very maybe? Call me a prude, a traditionalist, but to me, crisp sparkling water should be lime or lemon or at the most extreme, a light berry flavor. What is going on with these root beer, cola flavored sparkling waters? I think they would make me gag, not in a good way, but I don't want to be a judgy queen or chastise someone for not wanting a calorie free refreshment that tastes like their favorite soda. What's your favorite sparkling water with much love? Mac from Toronto, Canada. Do you have a, do you like sparkling water? Oh, I love sparkling water. And I will say that I do think that canned berry sparkling water is extreme. Uh, It doesn't have to be that extra. Um, Sparkling water, plain as it is, perfect. It doesn't need to be cold. I need it to be chilled. And if I had to say what my favorite sparkling water is, I mean, I'm more of a Pellegrino kind of girl. But if I want something that's flavored, um, I do love La Croix and mm-hmm. I love the Pamplemousse. Pamplemousse. Oh, that flavor my favorite. does taste good. Grapefruit. Yeah, it tastes like a bottle of perfume, mm-hmm. which I love perfume. My favorite sparkling water is Diet Coke. Um, <laughs> it, it, it mimics uh, ca- like Coca-Cola, but calorie free, sugar free. Um, it's, and it's sparkling. And so with no calories and no sugar and no carbohydrate, it it's a sparkling water to me. Yeah. When you said like sparkling water, root beer flavored, I was like, isn't that just root beer? I think so. You know what's weird to me? I love those flavor sticks that you put in still water, like a crystal light, something like that. I love those. But um, they make them in so many flavors. They have root beer. They have cream soda. And that just seems weird to me because you're taking the bubbles out of it. And then if you try putting one of those in a sparkling water, it blows up everywhere. It's crazy. So I don't know. It's just, as you said, like a flat water that's supposed to be sparkling. That just seems weird I to just, me. I love the tickle going down, you know, oh, the down tickle. the throat. The tickle of the bubbles. Uh-huh. You know, I have to share something with you that was shared with me recently, and it, it broke my heart. And I wanted to break yours and everybody listening. I was drinking sparkling water with a friend, uh, my friend Izzy. Izzy is she. Uh-huh. And, Who I love, yes. by the way. And Izzy said, you know, it's bad for your teeth. And I was like, what? And he was like, yeah, it just came out. It's bad for your teeth. So that really disappointed me. Now, every time I'm drinking sparkling water, I'm like, mm-hmm. is it bad for my teeth? And you know what you have to do? Wooden teeth like me. Oh, yes. Yep, that's what you have to do. <laughs> if you would like to send one of your letters in and have us talk about everything but the letter, um, send that to readmedelta at gmail.com. We can have uh, questions about etiquette or voting or the 30th congressional uh, district. We can talk about anything. Anything. So send them to readmedelta at gmail.com. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much, Delta and audience. Yeah, so happy. Um, Visit maybeagirlforcongress.org to donate to the campaign and learn more about how to vote for maybe. Again, thank you for being here. Where can people find you on social media? They can find me on Instagram at maybeagirl, and it's spelled M-A-E-B-E-A-G-I-R-L, or on Twitter. Do uh, people ever call you May? They do. They call me May. Also, I love when people call me Mabes. Does anyone call you B? Nobody no? calls me B because I'm an A girl. Right. I love this. Have you ever thought about the fact that some people uh, call Deborah Debbie or Deb, but no one calls her bruh? No. And they don't call me Maybra. Right. Why is that? I don't know. But I like Deb. I, you like Deb? Yeah. Okay. That's good. I like I, I like bruh. Also, my name maybe, I think it's so perfect for somebody who's non-binary. Mm-hmm. It's just like maybe, you know? When I hear you talk, it just makes so much sense. Thank you. It's just so much about inclusion, about really making a decision for everybody to get a piece of the pie. You know what I mean? And Literally, there's so much pie. The pie is endless. What we're doing is people are taking a piece of it and then they're throwing the whole thing away. Yes. They don't even use it. They're not even eating it. Speaking of pies, have you ever been to House of Pies? I have. Uh, Somebody told me, I was talking about House of Pies the other day, um, which is in my district, and somebody was like, oh, you mean the House of the House of Pies? And I thought that was so funny. I want to be a part of the House of the House of Pies. Yeah. What would you vote for as your best pie? Oh. Not just there, in general. In general, uh, I love a pecan pie. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Or pecan to some. Speak on to some. Yeah, I like that. I like a lemon meringue yeah. pie. Mm, yeah. But sometimes the meringue tastes too eggy. Ooh, that makes me sick. 
I'm going to throw up. That makes me sick. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. All right, listen. Uh, thank you so much for listening to Very Delta and watching uh, Very Delta. Our show comes out every single Monday. Subscribe to Mom Podcast's YouTube channel and turn on those notifications so you never miss an episode. Search for Very Delta on your favorite podcast apps to listen to the audio-only version uh, if you just can't take all of this beauty. I mean, hello. You can also sign up for premium offerings on Mom Plus Gold by visiting Mom podcast.plus where you get weekly episodes of more very delta don't forget to send all of your questions to read me delta at gmail.com and you can follow me on instagram at delta work we'll see you next week and until then keep things very delta to listen to very delta ad free a day early and to get access to more very delta sign up for mom plus gold at mompodcast.plus very delta is produced by moguls of media aka mom hosted by delta work production supervision and engineering by margo padilla editing and post production by doug robertson with original theme music by will pitts executive produced by willem alaska big dipper camille stennis and joe cilio You know, I need my go-go juice. Mom!